October of 1944. America is in the midst of World War II, and while the U.S. Armed Forces are preparing to invade and retake the Philippines, back at home, a different enemy, one not made of troops or guns, but of wind and water, is taking aim at Cuba and the Florida Gulf Coast. The 1944 Cuba-Florida hurricane is relatively unknown history to the communities it devastated, lost to memory in the face of more recent disasters like Charlie, Irma, Ian, and most recently, Helene and Melton. But the impacts from that storm are still being felt right here and now over 80 years later. I wanna take you on a journey today, back in time to tell you the story of this storm and why its importance and legacy have shaped not only the stretch of coastline I call home, but how it has a direct influence on the way we forecast these monster storms in the present day. I'm CJ Morgan, and this is Florida Man Weather. The 1930s and 40s were quite an active period for hurricanes in the United States. While the events of the Great Depression and the beginning of World War II dominate the period, the United States endured over 40 landfalling storms within those two decades, including some notable ones such as the 1935 Labor Day storm, the 1938 Long Island hurricane, and the 1941 Texas hurricane. These storms increased pressure on the U.S. government to provide timely warnings to save both life and property. So, in 1943, the U.S. Weather Bureau, the precursor to the present-day National Weather Service, began using airplanes to scout potential hurricanes. These were the first of the modern-day hurricane hunters. But by the time the 1944 hurricane season rolled around, the Weather Bureau had adopted a new secret weapon to add to their arsenal of forecasting tools, Rawinsons. These Rawinsons, a type of weather balloon instrument package that measured wind speed and direction, in addition to the usual temperature, pressure, and humidity, also allowed the instrument package to be tracked as the balloon descended via radar. This marked a turning point in hurricane forecasting. And for the first time, meteorologists were able to utilize upper air balloon data to more accurately predict a hurricane's path. It's here that we enter the 1944 hurricane season which had already been fairly active. By October, the United States had already experienced two landfalling systems, a small hurricane that made landfall near Oak Island, North Carolina on August 1st, and then a large, powerful hurricane had swept up the Atlantic coast, which would later be dubbed the 1944 Great Atlantic Hurricane. That storm would make landfall on Long Island on September 15th as a strong Category 2, then cross the Long Island Sound and make landfall on Rhode Island just hours later, bringing a large storm surge and wreaking nearly $100 million in damages from the Carolinas to Maine. Things seemed to calm down in the Atlantic, but by mid-October, the warm waters of the Caribbean were brewing another, more powerful storm. October 12th, 1944. Meteorologists notice a low-pressure system organizing over the Western Caribbean, one that would normally be barely worth a passing glance. But something was stirring, something powerful. The waters were warm and the atmosphere was ripe with energy. So within hours, the system had organized into a tropical depression and began rapidly intensifying. In less than a day, it had become a tropical storm, and then it was a hurricane. The first landmass to feel the storm's effects was the Cayman Islands, a small archipelago in the Caribbean near Jamaica. For days, the main island of Grand Cayman endured a relentless assault, sheets of rain, hammering winds, and a darkness that refused to lift. Over 31 inches of rain fell on the islands, setting an all-time record that still stands to this day. The island's entire crop yield was obliterated. Fields were swallowed whole and roads turned to rivers. Survivors remembered it as a siege, a storm that never seemed to move, just getting worse and worse and worse. But yet, the Caymans were merely the prelude. By October 16th, the system had become to accelerate northward, closing in on the island of Cuba. As it did so, the warm waters of the Caribbean fueled even further rapid intensification over those next two days. 
What had already been a violent storm was now evolving into a major hurricane. Its winds, now howling at 145 miles per hour, or equivalent to a strong Category 4, were closing in fast. In the early morning hours of October 18th, while much of the island still slept, the monstrous storm finally made landfall on Cuba, in the province of Pinar del Rio. Roaring ashore at full strength, it tore into the island's western provinces, with winds nearing 150 miles an hour. As the storm moved inland, a colossal 20-foot storm surge wiped the southern coast of the island. Entire villages vanished. Homes were wiped clean off their foundations, and schooners were hurled inland like toys. A massive oil barge was tossed 10 miles from the coast. As the storm moved across the island, the hurricane's eye passed just to the west of Havana, the capital, locking it in the northeastern eye wall, the strongest part of the storm. The city and its environs endured a relentless assault of wind and rain, with gusts reaching a staggering 163 miles per hour, the strongest winds ever recorded in Cuba until Hurricane Gustav in 2008, and the pressure bottomed out at 937 millibars. Trees snapped in half, roofs peeled off like paper, and even the presidential palace lost a portion of its roof. By morning, Havana looked like a war zone. As the storm moved off Cuba and into the warm waters of the Florida Straits, it set its sights on its next target, the Florida Gulf Coast. Meanwhile, in the US, forecasters watched these reports beginning to roll in from Cuba with growing alarm. The war had stretched every government agency to its limit. Resources were scarce and radar was still in its infancy. But a new technology, those raw insons we talked about earlier, offered forecasters a better look into the upper level winds. Many early forecasts showed the storm hooking south, perhaps scraping across the Everglades before dissolving harmlessly into inland flora. But the data from those raw winds deployed in the path of a storm for the first time in this hurricane told a different story. This storm was veering north towards Tampa, St. Petersburg, and Sarasota. Even with the raw winds data at their disposal, it wasn't a fast process. By the time forecasters at the Weather Bureau realized the storm would track further to the north, there was no time to waste. Warnings were sent out by telegraph, by radio, and by word of mouth. From Key West to Tampa Bay, authorities urged residents to evacuate the low-lying areas and barrier islands and seek shelter inland. Wartime blackouts still restricted night lighting along the coast and gasoline was still being rationed. Building materials like plywood to protect windows was scarce, and yet people still listened and heeded the warnings. In Sarasota, in Venice, in Bradenton and St. Pete, families packed what they could and left the coastline, heading inland. Even though many left the barrier islands, however, folks on the mainland with experiences of storms past stayed behind. By the evening of October 18th, the hurricane's vast eye passed directly over the dry Tortugas. For two haunting hours, a dead calm settled over the islands. Then, as the backside of the storm swept through, the winds came back with renewed fury, estimated at near 120 miles an hour. While the storm seemed to be weakening, something else was happening now too. The storm was expanding. Its eye had widened. Its outer bands now stretched hundreds of miles in every direction. It was no longer just a powerful hurricane, it was also a colossal one, and it was closing in on the Florida Gulf Coast. Then, just after midnight on October 19th, the storm made landfall in Sarasota County near the small town of Osprey. The winds screamed ashore at 105 miles per hour, category two strength. But what the storm had lacked in wind speed, it now made up for in size, making it feel far stronger. Coastal communities from Englewood to Bradenton took a direct hit, but hardest hit were areas just south of the point of landfall, like in Venice. The small 20-year-old town experienced a cataclysmic storm surge of 12 to 15 feet. Across Sarasota and Manatee counties, old trees bent and snapped, flooding from the heavy rain and salt water destroyed homes, businesses, and crops. And in downtown Sarasota, glass shattered in the storefronts on Main Street. Roofs peeled away like paper, and the Sarasota Army Airfield suffered massive damage. But the worst was yet to come. Sarasota Bay swelled and spilled over seawalls and coastal protections and overwashed the barrier islands like Siesta Key and Casey Key. 
Boats broke free of their moorings and were found half a mile inland the next morning. In Venice, entire streets were underwater. Bridges vanished under the storm surge, and homes along Warfield Avenue were ripped apart, and the Army Air Base there was devastated. In Bradenton, a barge and tugboat capsized off the coast, killing nine men, nearly half of Florida's total fatalities in the storm. Even towns far from the coast felt its reach. Tornadoes spun off by the storm's outer bands touched down in inland towns like Wachula and Arcadia. In places that rarely made hurricane headlines, homes were being ripped apart, trees were twisted to the ground, and utter devastation was being wreaked. As the hurricane pushed inland, its colossal size translated into a slow weakening process. In Tampa, which was brushed by the outermost part of the eyewall, the Weather Bureau office recorded a barometric pressure of 967 millibars, the lowest in 50 years. The winds reversed direction as the storm pushed inland across the coastal counties, tearing apart what had survived the first wave. Inland, citrus groves were shredded. Tens of thousands of trees were uprooted or stripped bare. Power lines lay tangled across highways, entire regions plunged into darkness. But only by late afternoon on October 19th, after nearly eight hours over the peninsula, did the storm finally lose its hurricane strength near Jacksonville. After tearing through Florida, the storm continued its destructive path up the East Coast, inflicting more damage to communities still reeling from the Atlantic hurricane a month prior. In Georgia, storm surge and winds caused up to a half a million $1944 in damage, flooding coastal neighborhoods in Brunswick and Savannah, swamping the ports. South Carolina felt the storm's outer bands with gusts up to 65 miles per hour and a nine-foot storm surge flooded Charleston's battery, while heavy rain destroyed cotton and forage crops across the state. As the storm raced into the mid-Atlantic and northeast, it unleashed widespread rains, coastal flooding, and strong winds. Even as far as New Hampshire, one life was lost in a rain-slicked car crash, the storm's last known victim in the U.S. Yet still, it raced forward, brushing the New England coastline, clipping Atlantic Canada, and finally fading into the North Atlantic near Greenland on October 24th. The storm had left behind a path of destruction spanning thousands of miles from the Caribbean to the North Atlantic. When the winds died and the waters receded, what remained was devastation on a scale likened to that in France during the war. The 1944 Cuba-Florida hurricane had carved a path of ruin from Cuba to Virginia. In Cuba, the capital city, Havana, now lay in ruins. In Florida, citrus groves, lifeblood of our region, were shredded and coastal cities were flattened by the wind and storm surge. Entire towns from the Gulf Coast to the Atlantic had been flooded or buried under toppled trees in the wreckage of what once was. And the cost? Absolutely staggering. Over $100 million in 1944 dollars, half of it in Florida alone. When adjusted for in modern times, the storm's economic toll ranks amongst the most economically destructive in U.S. history. It is still ranked number seven in the costliest hurricanes to this day. Yet, the 1944 Cuba, Florida hurricane's legacy is so much more than its ferocity, devastation, or financial impact. This storm completely changed the way we forecast and prepare for these giant hurricanes. For meteorologists, this storm marked two major milestones. First, it was the first time upper atmospheric data was broadly available throughout a hurricane's life cycle. Mr. Grady Norton, a meteorologist who led the Hurricane Forecasting Office in Miami at the time, analyzed that data and in a surprising turn for the time, was able to correctly project the storm's movement towards the Sarasota Bradenton area, even though the surface conditions suggested it should have been blocked by a high pressure zone. That accurate forecast not only helped drive the expansion of upper air observation systems across the country, which we still see today, but the early lead time meant evacuation orders were able to be issued in Florida just in the nick of time. This directly led to less loss of life, with only a handful of deaths attributed to the storm in Florida, rather than the thousands that were killed in individual storms in the past. The second, that came when one of those Rawlinsons captured a full atmospheric profile from inside the eye of the storm as the system passed over the Tampa Bay area. The 1944 Cuba, Florida hurricane may not be etched in the collective memory of those here on Florida's Gulf Coast, like Charlie, Irma, Ann, or Milton, 
but its legacy is embedded in every hurricane forecast we see today. It was a storm that tested the limits of science and community resilience during one of the most chaotic periods in world history. In its way, it left not only destruction, but transformation. The lessons learned from its wrath reshaped how we understand, predict, and respond to hurricanes, lessons that still echo every hurricane season. Hey everybody, I hope you really liked this video. If you did, please feel free to give it a thumbs up and make sure to like and subscribe, ring that bell so you don't miss more content like it in the future. Thanks again, CJ with Florida Man Weller.